once you average across the different areas, 1% of what they saw was transformative, 99% wasn't. Uh, that included things which could perhaps embed new practice or maybe influence what you did or maybe inform you of things. But really, we need to have a significantly higher portion of practice that transforms what happens in the classroom. So actually, what Curé found at that point and continue to find in a lot of their other work, there isn't really a lot of the transforming that happens in our schools, nowhere near as much as there should be. Um, so the problem is this. I'm modelling terrible professional learning. <laughs> Absolutely terrible, because you're passive... Um, I'm saying really brief things. I'm throwing some ideas at you, overloading working memory. I'm going to cause some really weak associations. So you're all sort of vaguely bringing up some of your, your chunks of information. And after you leave today, there'll be this really vague association with some of the stuff that David said in that, that day. Probably then all overlaid with other stuff that happened today. Um, some of it will be overloaded and never got stored anyway. And actually, unless everyone then goes home and forgets everything else today, just repeatedly thinks about what I was talking about and tries it out and thinks about it and reflects and reads the theory and so on and so forth, it's actually quite unlikely I'm going to change what's happening in your brains much. So this is how not to do professional learning. <laughs> um, now, NFER, a colleague from NFER here, hello. Um, so one of these studies they did, indeed, yes, hello. Um, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the panel surveys uh, they did back in 2008, I believe it was, was asking teachers how to evaluate the impact of your professional development. And the one that really, there were lots of different ways, including things like I look for impact on my practice, I reflect on how effective it's been, a colleague of mine tells me if something has changed. But the one I thought was most interesting was... Um, I evaluate the impact of my professional learning on student outcomes. And only 7% of respondents responded that they did that. And actually, when you broke it down, that was 3% of secondary schools and 11% of primary schools. Um, and primaries might feel slightly smug, but don't feel too smug, that's 11%. Um, it's very hard to do, that's why, because actually CPD is set up in a way, it's really difficult, really difficult to evaluate the outcomes on student learning. But somehow I feel the number should be higher than that. Um, now, Vivian Robinson also looked at the sort of activities that leaders could engage in, which raised, um, which improved student outcomes. And actually, a standout, the standout result there was actually that one of the most effective activities that leaders could engage in in order to improve student outcomes was the leading of teacher learning and development. Lots of other stuff was really important, ensuring people come to work and in an orderly and safe environment where students are happy to learn, resourcing strategically, picking the right curriculum materials, having great goals and high expectations, etc., etc., ensuring sort of slightly more standardised teaching. That, that's great, but really, not surprisingly, the process where teachers were forced to recall information, think about it, reflect on it, learn the theory underneath it, and then actually reconceptualise their practice and make, make it instinctive, doesn't surprise anyone, really, to say that that was the thing that changed what happened in schools most, that improved the outcomes the most. So um, that's a really important study, but actually it's the whole thing that a lot of leaders don't necessarily look at that. Now, CPD, what are the things we really shouldn't be doing, or rather, what, what are the things that are insufficient for really transforming practice? So, if all someone does, and this is a classic problem, is we haven't done behaviour again. Send someone off on a behaviour course. Great, we've sent someone off on a behaviour course. Tick. Um, not surprisingly, that doesn't change much that happens in the school. Um, so, sending people off on these one-off sort of generic courses, how to be an outstanding Ofsted teacher, simply do these five tricks and use post-it notes this way. Um, whole staff lectures, smug person from the local authority stands up and tells you how to do behaviour better. Uh, distributing printed guidance. These are generally the least effective sort of approaches for transforming teacher practice. Um, but of course that's what happens a lot. Now of course they're perfectly reasonable for informing someone how to, for informing someone of the latest regulations. Because we're not expecting the latest regulations to be embedded in someone's practice. But they're really not appropriate if we're really hoping to change the way someone instinctively uses questioning as part of their teaching. But, and yet we see that's what happens a lot. There we go. Opera and header, etc. for the TDA. Teachers describe CPD activities that often deviate from the TDA definition, primarily delivered through lectures, presentations, and discussion. 
teachers reported little active learning. Now, it's fine sometimes, it is fine sometimes, but it just happens way too much. There is not enough of this more active learning that's designed carefully to really help teachers reconceptualize and really think deeply about their practice. Uh, so that's no good. So basically, we have a system where we're actually beginning to, and actually this is what's happening now, we're about to go out and do lots more research into what works, and then we're going to disseminate it, and we're going to send lots of research papers around, not give people time to think about it or reflect on it, send stuff around to them, we're going to have more lectures, little YouTube clips, um, I get lynched by this sometimes, but you know, teach meets where people have three minutes to tell you about something, and we're going to load loads more information. Because what the problem at the moment is, goes that theory, teachers just don't have access to enough information. <laughs> huh. Not convinced. Uh, dissemination of research. You can't simply just turn on a tap and just wash lots more information over teachers. Just not going to work. How are teachers possibly going to learn from that? How would anyone learn from that? You can't just spl splurge information at people. <coughs> now, obviously, there is better dissemination. There is better sharing good practice. But just every time someone says oh yeah, we do lots of sharing good practice here. Frankly, a klaxon should go off. You know, it should be the, oh my goodness, someone is talking about the sharing good practice klaxon. What does that really mean? Are we being superficial again? Question. <laughs> you know, kind of worrying, isn't it? It would be a bit like saying, if the least healthy profession are medics. <laughs> Ironically, actually, they have really bad smoking rates and things, don't they? So, uh, but nevertheless, you know, it's practice what you preach sort of thing. Uh, physician heal thyself. And I do begin to think that actually, if we're now getting very excited about the application of cognitive science to our learners, perhaps we should really think about that for ourselves. Actually, before we even get to the application of cognitive science, we know how to construct quite good learning experiences for students. And adult learning is not so different from student learning. As Philippa often says, what's source for the goose is source for the gander. If it's good for your students, then maybe we need to think about those same sorts of experiences for our teachers. And yet, while no one's allowed to stand up and do an unsatisfactory lesson where they just talk like this at their students, <laughs> we're apparently allowed to do it for teachers all the time. <laughs> Funny that. So big question, really. Um, now, of course, you can really engage deeply with thinking. You can look at all these chunks of knowledge, reconceptualize them, theoretically change what's happening in your head. You can get filled with lots of new tools. You can completely change what you're doing in the classroom. You can do all these wonderful things. And of course, it's entirely possible students won't benefit at all. So just because teachers are learning better, doesn't necessarily mean that students are learning better. So we do have to be a little bit careful here and begin to think about, are we spending time in a way that is valuable for our students? Now, I'm not saying teacher learning in itself is not valuable. I'm just saying that we're in the schools to help the students learn, and that's why we got into the profession. So surely our priority in our own learning should be to help the students. Not the only thing, but it should be a priority. Now, things that can work in terms of actually getting ideas from research, from other practitioners, from evidence, and, in and, in and getting these into our own practice. So things like collaborative inquiry and lesson study, I'll talk about that more in a minute. Things like uh, a really effective coaching model. Things like carefully scripted teacher actions. Things like certain other sorts of action research, things like master's level study with classroom elements. Now, all of these have big caveats. Things can go horribly wrong. I mean, you can see how carefully scripted teacher actions could be disaster <laughs> if you're saying, follow this five steps and don't want you to think about why you're doing it and you're not going to know when to go off piste and you're not going to recognise when you need to slow down or speed up. However, we're just talking about how do we actually create simple, effective learning for teachers. There are some cases where it might help. The, where the evidence is strongest is the top two, collaborative inquiry and coaching. Now, that's not surprising, actually, because we know there are certain things that make really effective professional learning. And uh, I'm just going to briefly talk about what those are. And then, again, 
this isn't necessarily drawn from the evidence base. This is what I've been thinking about. This, if that's how learning happens and that's how great professional learning appears to improve student outcomes, why do I think that might be? So I'm not necessarily drawing from a written evidence base here. Great professional learning should be aspirational. It should be something that the teachers actually are interested in doing for the benefit of their learners. That tends to make professional learning experiences more effective. Um, now, I think that's probably in as much as you're mo more motivated to engage in hard thinking. Um, I also think it's because you can then contextualise the thinking related to your own students. But as soon as it's based around, actually, I really want this for my own students. Generally, great professional learning doesn't happen when you say, how do we convert these to Cs? It's not a big aspiration, unless you're a senior leader in, in much fear. Uh, collaborative professional development tends to work very effectively. And I think partly, again, you work together. It's partly because you, know, you don't want to let other people down. You feel motivated and working something together as professionals, that professional dialogue. But also, if three people together have a slightly different conceptualization of what's happening in the classroom, through discussion and dialogue, we will discover differences. And actually, that will cause some challenge in a quite trusting environment. We will challenge each other just by saying, oh, well, actually, I don't see it that way. I see it this way. And of course, that's helpful because that makes you kind of pick apart uh, your concepts, pick apart your chunks of memory, and actually look at what the differences might be. That's why I suspect that's two ideas of why that might work very well together. Uh, should be relevant to your current practice, sort of just in time, not two years before you need to use it. Um, relevance is really important because actually if you can do something you can then do in your classroom straight away, then you're not just doing something theoretical. You can actually get environmental stimulation as well as theoretical stimulation at the same time. And you can actually try it out straight away. So I think that's, uh, that's why that's probably quite helpful. Um, sustained... Um, one of the papers I've been looking at recently says you have to sustain things for at least 30 hours. There are a number of different studies floating around. And obviously, there's no magic fixed number. But I usually like to frighten people by saying 30 to 50 hours, particularly senior leaders. <laughs> um, because I, then, uh, although some of them I can see in their heads go, I'm going to glue teachers' heads to, a, to seats for 30 hours. By the end of that 30-hour mammoth session, they will know how to do AFL. <laughs> um, I, I'm trying to move away from that. Um, but sustained for a very long period anyway. And that's something that's quite important because you need to repeatedly recall and think and remember and recall and think and remember and try out and get challenged and, and so on. It's got to be a long, long process. Underpinned by theoretical understanding. So this is something that is desperately, horribly missing from a lot of the CPD that we see. Top tips for teachers. And actually AFL was doomed for, uh, for William and Black who are ultimately, all their careful thinking got turned into targets on the board, comment-only marking, uh, a couple of other bits of nonsense, and, oh, you're doing AFL now. That's, you're doing AFL, great. And no one then thought, what's it really mean? Why am I doing it? How can I use it to help my students learn? It was desperately awful. So that's, that's something that's really important. Something that needs to be evaluated, and again, this can sometimes get missed out in professional learning experiences, is it making a difference? Are we doing stuff, or are we doing stuff that makes a difference? And actually, it's perfectly reasonable to do it formatively, so you can constantly refine and get the feedback you need to change your thinking, and summatively. Was that a good use of our time? Um, challenging. Sometimes things need to be challenging. We can't just take all the thoughts we have, whack on an extra bit of, uh, an extra post-it note, and then bung it back into our memory. Sometimes we do have to go, <gasps> one of my bits of conceptualisation about how students learn was wrong. And it can be quite painful. There's a, it's not a strong piece of research base, but there is a little bit of research um, that uh, Paul, uh, Paul Chris mentioned recently about uh, evaluation sheets to courses. And uh, that there may potentially be a negative correlation between how happy people were after their courses and how much impact it had. So if I make this deeply unpleasant, perhaps it will have more impact. I'm not suggesting everyone should go and be horribly abusive to everyone else in order to make it a better learning experience, but actually, challenge does help us learn. Learning isn't comfortable, and it shouldn't just be lots of fluff. Um, led by leaders, and I talked about that one before. Inquiry models are things like identifying exactly what is it we're